So this talk is actually, you can find it on my website, and if you all go and find it on the website, you might even be able to crash the website. The nets that work best for recognizing objects, the neural nets that work best, are these convolutional nets of the type developed by Yan, where you have layers of feature extraction, and then you do local pooling, which throws away precise information about position, but gives you a little bit of translational invariance. And in a previous lecture, I showed that Alex Krzyzewski got them to work extremely well um, for the ImageNet competition. So they're getting a small amount of translational invariance by averaging these replicated feature detectors, or by taking the max. And this is a disaster. Um, so even though these are the best current nets, um, convolutional neural networks are doomed. Now I have to modify that remark after Rob's talk, because you will notice my talk is almost identical to Rob's talk. It's just completely different ideologically. Um, so his talk is about how good convolutional neural nets were because they can do these wonderful things. My talk is about how bad they are because they can't do the, these wonderful things. But they're basically the same talk. Um, so the problem is that subsampling loses information about position. And so for higher level parts, like a nose and a mouth, you no longer know how they're related to each other. And so you can't recognize whose face it is. You can recognize that it's a face because there's a nose floating around and there's a mouth floating around, so it's probably a face. But to know whose face it is, you need to know this precise spatial relationship. And what Rob was doing was remembering where all these things that you pulled were, and so retaining that information. He was just doing it for position, and initially just for integer positions. Um, and he was using replicated copies of the same thing to detect features in those integer positions. Um, I'm going to suggest something that works a bit better than that, I think. So first of all, I want to get over the equivariance versus invariance point. What most people are trying to recognize objects are trying to do is get what they think of as invariant representations. They would like to eliminate information about how things are, that are irrelevant are varying, like lighting and viewpoint and all those things. Um, and they try and eliminate that information in the neural activities. And that's completely the wrong thing to do. Um, when you see an object moving, it's not like your neural, neurons don't change. What's happening is they're changing, but there's something else that's invariant, which is your knowledge of the shape of this object. But your knowledge of the shape of the object isn't in neural activities. Your knowledge of the shape of the object is in the weights. So what we want is to have invariant knowledge in the weights leading to equivariant activities. That is, as this changes, the activities all change, but you know it's the same shape. Um, that may become clearer later. So if you ask, what's the right representation of images? When I introduced deep nets in the first lecture, I said, um, we're going to try and learn features by thinking of a generative model. And then I said, we're going to make the generative model be composed of stochastic binary units. And that's not exactly what they use in generative models of images, like computer graphics. Um, so I've got a nice little piece of logic for you here, which is there's two things that have no problem with viewpoint. One is computer graphics, and the other is animal vision. Therefore, they work the same way. Now, that's not strict textbook logic, but I actually believe it. Um, so in graphics programs, how do they deal with viewpoint? Well, they have a hierarchy of parts, and they know the relationship between uh, a whole and a part, and they code that relationship by a matrix, if we're dealing with rigid geometry. And what that matrix will do is allow you to take the pose of the hole, that is, how the hole is relative to the camera, take those pose parameters, multiply them by the matrix, and you'll get how the part is relative to the camera. And the good thing about representing pose like that is that that's a linear operation. So your knowledge in this matrix of how the hole is related to the part um, is linear, and that's going to allow you to do massive extrapolation in a way you can't do with nonlinear models. Um, so the matrices of viewpoint invariant, but the neural activities that represent the poses are highly variant. And I want to convince you, first of all, I want to take some time convincing you that you really do impose coordinate frames on things. And the way your vision works is by relating things to coordinate frames. Because that's part of the argument that shows we really do have stuff like what, like what computer graphics has. Um, it's not just a whole bunch of, a whole big table of what things look like from different viewpoints. The way we understand shapes is by relating to them to rectangular coordinate frames. 
Um, it's not just that, that was Descartes' real contribution to the understanding of the mind, Cartesian coordinates. Um, so if you look at this image here, this is a country, um, at least if you ask some American politicians, <laughs> and um, most people when they look at that don't recognize it. Um, if I tell you the tops here and the bottoms there, you immediately see it's Africa. Um, and the question is, why didn't you recognize it? Many of the theories we have of object recognition say just by rotating something, that shouldn't stop you recognizing it. Um, but almost nobody recognizes that as Africa first time they see it. Here's another example that's so familiar it doesn't really have its impact anymore, which is this object can be seen as an upright diamond or a tilted square. And your knowledge of what's going on in that shape is totally different depending on which way you see it. So if you think the top is here, and these are the two sides, you'll be very, very acutely aware of whether this is a right angle or not. If I do it sort of two degrees off, you'll notice that and you'll say it's not quite right. If you see it as a diamond, you'll be completely unaware of whether there are any right angles in it. When you're seeing it as a diamond, I can make the, the, thing, the right angles be five degrees off and you won't notice, but you'll be acutely aware of whether this corner is at the same height as that corner because you're relating it to a rectangular frame like this. And you only notice right angles when they line up with a rectangular frame. That's what's important about a right angle. Not that it's 90 degrees, but that it allows things to line up with rectangular axes. So I'm going to give you a more extreme example of that. Um, I'm going to give you a little task to do, and you have to actually do it. Um, and this involves, um, it's going to involve holding your finger up in the air. So your left finger. Um, so here's the task. You can imagine a wireframe cube. Um, no, I can't do that. So you're imagining this wireframe cube. Imagine it's sitting on the desk in front of you, and it's sort of this big. And from your point of view, there's a front bottom right-hand corner, and there's a top back left-hand corner. And what you're going to do is you're going to rotate the cube so that the top back left-hand corner is immediately above the front bottom right-hand corner. OK, so put your finger in the air above the desktop where that top corner is. OK, it's only a cube, this thing, right? You know what a cube is, right? Good. Um, so now put your left finger there. And now with your right finger, just point to where the other corners of the cube are. Because of course you can imagine a cube. OK, now what will happen, this is a particularly smart audience, but what will happen is most people will go sort of there, 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 and there. And then they'll say, no, maybe, maybe it's there, 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 and there. The problem is the cube has eight corners, and there's two. And if you point out four more, you got it wrong. And a lot of you will have pointed out four more. Um, the fact is you just don't know where the other corners of the cube are unless you're a crystallographer. Um, because a cube in that orientation is something you're not used to dealing with. This is like the diamond. And it has all sorts of properties that you don't know about despite its name, which says three, it has an interesting threefold rotational symmetry about, the, about, about that axis I gave it. But by forcing you to use that as the axis of the cube, I made you unable to use your normal knowledge about cubes, because that knowledge is relative to the normal coordinate frame you assign to a cube. And when you see it relative to a different coordinate frame, it's just a completely different object psychologically. It has threefold rotational symmetry. Um, I can show you where the corners are in case you're wondering. So the middle ring of the edges is colored, shown in color there. Um, so these are the six corners you should have pointed out. It's like a sort of benzene ring. Um, and I'll show you some more illusions with this. They're not exactly illusions, but things about the way you represent shapes. I've colored it so you can see it as a crown with three triangular flaps. And if you just show people that and then take it away again and ask them, were there any right angles there? They typically say no. And if you say, were there any pairs of parallel edges there? And they say no. Because you're thinking of it as a flap, a flap going up like this, a flap going up like this, and a flap going up like this. If I color it differently, like that, you can see it as what I call a zigzag, where there's a central rectangle like this, and these are its two ends and then a flap that goes up and a flap that goes down. And you might like to puzzle about the fact that here the flap goes down and out, and previously the flaps went up and out, and how could that be true? Um, so what's happening here is this ring of six rods 
has a number of completely different internal representations. And that tells us something about how your brain is representing stuff. It tells us it's doing it relative to coordinate frames. It's not like the Necker cube, where when you see it flip, you think there's something different out there in reality. Here, when you conceive of it differently, you're not disagreeing with somebody who thinks about it the other way, but you are aware of different properties. So here's a picture of what a representation of the, the three flaps might look like. So it's a crown, it's got three flaps, and each flap has two edges. And if we're going to do that in computer graphics, what we'd do is say, um, we'll impose a coordinate frame on the whole crown, we'll impose a coordinate frame on a flap, which will be the natural one, that is the axis of the triangle on the base of the triangle, and then we'll have a matrix that says how the whole crown is related to a flap. And similarly, we'll have a matrix that says how the flap is related to one of the edges of the flap. Um, so that's what a psychologist would draw as a representation of what you know about the crown. I know because I drew it and I was a psychologist. Um, this is the rectangle. Um, and you'll notice what's happened is the parts have been grouped differently. And this part didn't exist in the previous thing. But both of these are kind of your knowledge of the shape. But they don't tell you anything about how you're viewing it. If you form a mental image of that shape, mental images always come with viewpoints. Now, some psychologists, like Steve Coslin, um, for reasons best known to themselves, think that mental images are 2D arrays. Um, but the crucial thing about a mental image is it has a viewpoint. Now, of course, 2D arrays have viewpoints. When you make a picture, you need a viewpoint. And so if the only thing you know that has a viewpoint is a picture, then of course images have to be pictures. But there's other things that have viewpoints, namely a structural description that you've represented uh, with, where you combine the structural description with its, rep with its relationship to the camera. So something like this. So there's the crown structural description. But in addition to knowing how each part is related to the whole, we also know how each part is related to the camera. OK, that's just another matrix. That's the viewing transform. And you'll notice that if you know how the crown is related to the camera, and you know how the flap is related to the crown, if you multiply these two matrices together, you get this matrix. Um, and that's how the flap is related to the camera. And that's what you do in computer graphics. Computer graphics consists of primitive computer graphics consists of you know where the whole, what the whole thing is like, what pose you want for the whole thing, and so now you have to figure out the poses for the parts. You take the pose for the whole thing, you multiply it by the relationship between the whole and the part, and you get the pose for the part. And you keep going till you get to little triangles, and that's the end of geometry, and then you do rendering. Then you start worrying about light. But geometry consists of layers of this kind of stuff um, in my simplified model of computer graphics. And I think that computer vision is just exactly the same thing, but going in the other direction. Um, that's what I mean by computer vision being inverse graphics. That is, when a computer graphics person takes this matrix, multiplies it by that matrix, and gets this matrix, a computer vision person needs to take this matrix, multiply it by that matrix, and get this matrix, um, as you'll see. So the question is, why do we form mental images? So let me give you a task that makes you form a mental image. Um, you go a mile east, and then a mile north, and then a mile east again, what's your direction back to your starting point? And you all know it's sort of southwest-west, whatever you call that. Um, but here's something you did, reliably. You did not imagine the journey like this, and then like this, and then like this. You imagine it like this, and then like this, and then like this. What's more, you didn't imagine the journey like this, and then like this, and then like this. So you had to put your glasses on to see what was going on. And you didn't imagine it, your mental glasses. Then you didn't imagine it like this, and like this, and like this. You imagined it sort of this size, and you imagined it this way up. And there's nothing in the task that says you have to do that, right? What's happening there is you somehow want to relate different parts of this journey together. And if you build yourself a representation, like this one, you can just read the answer off. In other words, if I have my piece of the journey, and I know how each of them is related to me, to the viewer, then if I want to know the relation between this piece and this piece, I just look at that and that. Or more importantly, if I want to know the relation between this piece and this piece, 
I look at how they're both related to the viewer, and from that I can read off how they're related to each other. I think that's the main reason you form mental images, to do things like that. Once you've got a representation like this, like this one, you can do analog operations on it. You can, for example, with the crown, you can imagine the petals folding in. But you can also imagine it rotating. That is, you can imagine it changing continuously the relation of all the pieces to the viewer. And back in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of study of mental rotation. And there was always a kind of puzzle, um, which was, why do you do mental rotation? So a lot of people who hadn't thought much, and you still hear people in computer vision saying this, say that in order to recognize an object, you mentally rotate it. Well, that's complete nonsense. The timings are all wrong. It just doesn't fit any of the data. Um, so here, for example, you knew that was an upside down R, and you knew that was an upside down R in about 200 milliseconds. Um, but if I asked you, is it a mirror image R or a correct one, then that takes you an extra few hundred milliseconds. And what you do during that extra few hundred milliseconds is you go chunk, 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 chunk. And then you say, oh, it faces that way, and a real one should face this way, so it's a backwards R. So why do you do that? Um, why is it that to decide the handedness of something, you have to do a mental rotation? Because that's a sure way to force people to do mental rotations, asking about handedness of things in unfamiliar orientations. Um, and I'll give you a good neural net explanation for that in a minute. Um, but there is lots of evidence, or well, there was in the 80s, and I, no, I haven't seen any contradiction to it, that when you do this task, you actually are um, doing a continuous change in your representation. And the, the most convincing evidence is when you're halfway through this task, I flash up an R at that orientation and ask you, is it the same or opposite to that one? And you can answer that immediately. Um, so you have something appropriate to the orientation that's halfway, halfway in between. Another convincing piece of evidence is for that particular R, if you give it to a group of subjects, you'll get multimodal reaction times. One peak is for going this way, and a slightly longer peak is for going that way. Um, but notice that to know which way to go at all, you have to recognize that it's an R. You have to know what the top is. Um, of course, it could be a Swedish B. I just made that up, but you know, a funny B with a funny, a funny little thing there, where in which case it will be an upright thing. Um, and you can see it like that. But you saw it as an upside down R. OK, so why do we need to mentally rotate it to say what the handedness is? Well, you know the relation to you of that R. And so all you need to know is the handedness of that viewing transform. If you think of that as a matrix with a bunch of entries in it, well, I think it really is like that, um, how do I determine the handedness of this matrix? Well, it's the sign of the determinant. Um, and that's a tricky high order thing to compute. You can't just look at individual entries. It involves all the entries. Um, and so you can't compute it directly from your neural representation. But what you can do is do these continuous transformations until the two matrices line up in all but one direction, and then it's a trivial decision. And that's what you're doing when you do mental rotation. That's why you have this extraordinary ability to look at some weird shoe and say that's this weird shoe and it's by, well, some of us do. It's this weird shoe and it's by this particular fashion designer and it was produced in sort of 1983, but they're normally in a different color. Um, and then I say, yeah, but is it a left-handed one or a right-handed one? And you say, I haven't got a clue. Um, in other words, you know everything about this shoe except its handedness, if it's in some unusual orientation. Okay. So, here's the representation I would like to use for both computer graphics and computer vision. Um, you extract some part, you have some guess that this might be a mouse. You have the pose of the mouse, and this is going to be a bunch of neurons. And associated with those neurons, there's some other neuron that says whether it believes that the mouth is there at all. So if this guy says there isn't a mouth there, this would be a logistic unit. You can ignore what these guys say. But if this guy says there's a mouth there, then from the pose of the mouth, I can predict the pose of the face. I just take this pose, I multiply it by the matrix that says what the relation is between the two and I get a prediction. If I've also found a nose, and I know the pose of the nose, I can multiply that by this relation, and I should get something that tells me the pose of the face. And if these two predictions are equal, then I've got a face there. Because these two predictions being equal tells me that the mouth and the nose are related correctly geometrically to make a face. 
But to do that check, to see that they have the right geometric relation to make a face, it's not like a mouth here and a nose over there, um, I have to know these poses. And what Rob was doing in the deconvolutional nets was moving towards a system that has this pose information, initially just for position. But he started off with just integer position and then went further to real value position and it worked better. I want to go the whole hog and go to a full affine pose here, um, as you'll see later. So the crucial pop property of extracting pose vectors for parts and knowing not just where, but you know, what orientation, what size, all in the representation used in computer graphics, is that it's very easy to then learn a hierarchy because you can check whether pieces fit together right by just doing this, seeing if they make the same prediction. And what you've done is you've captured geometric relations as linear operations. And that's going to give you so the weights in your neural network, these weights here, those same weights work whatever this pose is. So if you've trained on data where the small things and they don't vary in orientation much, and they're always here, and you've learned this, you have to have some variation, and you learned this matrix, and I now test you on something where there's huge things and they're way over there in a completely different orientation, you'll have no problem, because it's the same knowledge. Um, and that's what neural nets can't do at present. Okay. So notice the, the matrix of weights in this representation has got the invariant information about the shape. The activities, which represent the pose, they vary as you vary the pose. Um, but the knowledge is in the weights. So if you ask, how are we going to extrapolate shape recognition to very different sizes, orientations, and positions to the ones we trained on. If you remember Andrew In's talk, he sort of fitted in with current computer vision, not like the sensible computer vision of 30 years ago, but like current computer vision, um, which is all statistical and stuff, um, and said that, well, just learn it from lots of different viewpoints and have lots of data and hope for the best. Um, and you're going to need an awful lot of data to do this, because 3D viewpoints, there's a lot of variation. I think the only reasonable alternative is to, since we know we're going to have to do massive extrapolation, to get the knowledge into a linear model. The only models that really extrapolate nicely are linear models. See, the thing about a linear model is you start off this way and you just keep going that way. If it's a non-linear model, you have to wiggle and you don't know how to wiggle. Um, that's my mathematical version of Taylor's theorem. Um, OK. So we want to get geometry into a linear model. And I'm going to give you an example. This is just a toy example to be with. This isn't real vision. This is just illustrating the point. Um, a student of mine called Charlie Tang um, took images composed of five ellipses. Actually, he didn't take images. He took the pose vectors of five ellipses. So the data came as the pose of the ellipse. Now notice, this is exactly the same bag of ellipses as this is. As bags of ellipses, um, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a face and a sheep. It's the relations between the parts that count, right? The relations between the ellipses, the geometric relations. Um, so what Charlie did was this. He took training data like that and fitted a factor analysis model. That is, to begin with, you cheat. You tell it which ellipse is which. You say there's a mouth ellipse, and then there's a nose ellipse, and then there's a left eye ellipse, and the right eye ellipse, and the whole face ellipse. And that's a little vector of 30 numbers. And what we know is the relation between the ellipses won't change if the shape rotates or scales or whatever. So what he's going to do is learn a linear model that uses just a few numbers, namely the pose of the whole face, to explain the poses of all the parts. And that linear model is factor analysis. Um, and so if you fit factor analysis to 30-dimensional vectors derived from these images, um, you, the factors are going to represent the pose parameters of the whole face. And then you can generate from your model. And look at the scale here. This goes from sort of minus 0.5 to 1.5. That's the range of positions. And they're all more or less upright. And they're all quite small. If you learn a model on that, then take your factors and now give the factors big values and generate, you get things like this. So look at this face here. This is at a completely different orientation. It's got the eyes and the nose and the mouth in the right place. Um, 
This is the mean of the training data, but it's doing massive generalization. You can do that, computer graphics can do that, and these silly deep neural nets can't do that. Okay. Um, they need to be modified in the way Rob was talking about, but even more extreme, even more towards computer graphics. I think he's just taking the first step, and you just need to go much further along that road. Um, this is sheep. He learned a separate... Uh, Charlie assures me the sheep just came out like that. Um, <laughs> you generate from the model, and you get massively different sheep. Um, then you can take... So there's two cheats here. One is we told it it was faces and learned one model for faces. Um, also, we told it which ellipse was which. You can get over both those problems quite easily. So, so this is how the factor analysis works. You take the poses of the ellipses, you take the factors, and you train a linear model. And the linear model will say, I've got some factor loadings that derive this from that, and I've got some more factor loadings that derive this from that. And so obviously it's going to be very happy if these are in a fixed geometric relationship. To learn how to assign the ellipses to the blocks in the factor analyzer, the blocks of it, the input vector of the factor analyzer, you can just try all combinations, and that'll work fine. So what you do is you take some training data, you take your initial model, you try all 120 combinations, you see which one makes the factor analyzer happiest, which gives it the smallest reconstruction error, and then you say that's training data. And if you keep going like that for a short time, very quickly the factor analyzer decides what goes where, and then it'll be very unhappy if you put things in the wrong place, except for the two eyes, which you can switch around if the face is nice and symmetric. Um, so that solves the assignment problem. You can do a search. And if you're worried about doing the search, then you can make a feedforward neural network that tells you, um, that initializes that search with probably the correct solution. Um, to deal with the fact that there's more than one shape in the world, we just fit a mixture of factor analyzers. There's efficient code for mixtures of factor analyzers. This is a very nice algorithm. And so you can give it lots of different shapes and train a mixture. And one, one component of the mixture, one factor analyzer, will grab each shape. So Charlie can train on faces and sheep without telling it the poses, without telling which ellipse is which. And it'll learn a mixture of two factor analyzers. After it's learned, I already showed you it can generate things that are massively different viewpoints, but it can also cope really well with massive distortions. And there were no distortions in the training data. The training data was almost perfect. Um, but you give it these red ellipses, and it tries the sheep factor analyzer, it tries the face factor analyzer. The face factor analyzer wins by a factor of about e to the 40. Um, and this is the reconstruction from the factors of the factor analyzer that won. And so you can see it sort of understood that face. And this is the best compromised face. Um, here's another one where the mouth is actually outside the face. It has no problem. It's totally confident as a face. And vice versa for highly distorted sheep. So it can do massive generalizations of viewpoint. It can do massive um, distortions that it never saw during training. And this is going to greatly cut down on the amount of data you need to feed through that neural network if you wire this in. So this is like convolutional nets, but actually much more so. We're going to wire in much more by making, by committing to the idea we're going to go for the graphics representation inside the neural net. Now there's one big problem in what I said so far. To get all this to work, Charlie had to give it the poses of the ellipses. He wasn't giving it images, he was giving it the parts already. He was giving it the sort of bottom level parts, already nicely packaged up with their pose vectors. What happens if you just have images? Because um, we have to get from the rendered image back to some primitive parts with their poses. That is, we have to de-render the image. And we know that's an extremely non-linear operation. Um, fortunately, we have GPUs that are very good at de-rendering as well as at rendering. Um, so um, this is an MNIST image in case you don't recognize it yet. Um, actually, it's drawn by hand, but you know what I mean. It's a digit. We're going to have a bunch of things I call capsules. If you're a neuroscientist, think of things like mini columns. The idea of a capsule is a sort of computer science idea. It's going to do lots of internal computation and encapsulate the results in just a few numbers. Um, so it's like a function. Um, it's got a whole bunch of recognition neurons here, which are going to be logistic units. And in this case, it's going to output 
the x-coordinate of the thing that it likes to find, the y-coordinate of the thing that it likes to find, and a number that will be zero if the thing that it likes to find really isn't there, and we'll say how intense the thing it's found is in the image. Um, and we want these capsules to go off and find different fragments, but we want to be able to do that without telling it what the origin of the coordinate frame for this fragment should be, or indeed what this fragment should be. So what this capsule is going to output after it's trained is just three numbers. Okay. Um, so how are we going to train it? Well, there's various ways of doing this. We had a method called transforming autoencoders that works. We have another method that's sort of simpler, um, which is you define a simple decoder. And in a sense, when you take a convolutional neural net and say you're going to do max pooling and you're then going to um, remember where things came from so you can do unmax pooling, that's very like this definition of a simple decoder. Um, we say each capsule is going to learn a fixed template, which you think of as a bunch of biases, and then we're going to allow the capsule to translate that template and scale the intensity of it and then plonk it down in the image. So we're going to have an autoencoder that looks like this. The image, the capsules that output just these numbers. Associated with each capsule is a bunch of biases that it's learned, which are its template. The template doesn't depend on the input, right? Whether the template's there or not depends on the input, but the template is independent of the input. Um, it learns slowly over time. And the way this generates an image is it takes this, it translates it by x and y, it scales it by i, and it puts it in the image. And we've got a whole bunch of capsules doing that, so presumably they should find nice parts of shapes. So another student um, took MNIST digits and learned 10 capsules. So now the representation of the shape is just going to be 30 numbers. And what he got was templates that looked like this. There's only 10 of them. And you can see they're sort of feathered pieces of stroke. So they're sort of dense in one place, and then they feather after that. You're only allowed to do translation. And with these 10 things, it can do a remarkably good job of, of reconstructing shapes. So these are the shapes. These are the reconstructions. And this shows you how it uses the capsule. So look at this capsule here. This is putting in kind of the the loop of the six here. It's putting in the loop of the three here. It's putting in this loop of the two here, ignoring the tail. Down here where there's no loop, it's putting in something very faint. Um, in the five, it's putting in the loop of the five. And you can see that what the capsule contributes to the image moves about. So the encoding network has decided how to use this. One important thing about this is the capsule is only allowed to put one thing in the image. You can put one or no things. An individual capsule can't put more than one thing. Um, so if you have several copies of the same feature in an image, you need several capsules to handle it. But it does very good reconstructions. So Taman then went off and said, um, no, not until a few more slides. OK. So what do we do next? We take those 10 capsules. We take the three outputs of each capsule. We concatenate them together. There's no assignment problem here. We just always concatenate them in the same order. And we do factor analysis. Actually, we do a mixture of factor analysis. We do a mixture of 10 factor analyses. And so Taman decided to use the number 10 with three different meanings. There's 10 components of the mixture. There's 10 capsules. And each factor analyzer in the mixture of 10 factor analyses has 10 factors. Those are three different values of 10. And if you use 9 and 10 and 11, it would have been much clearer. Um, so if you do factor analysis on this representation of the image, what do you get? So this is what happens if you apply a mixture of 10 factor analyzers directly to the pixels, which I was doing in the 90s. I mean, you get something, things that are somewhat specific to digits, but it's a mess. And that's because as you distort digits, the changes aren't linear. And so a linear model can't possibly capture them. It can just capture very small local changes. This is the means you get if you apply a mixture of 10 factor analyzers to the outputs of these capsules. This is all totally unsupervised. Nobody's told this anything about classes yet, except by saying you might guess that there's 10 of them. Um, 
And notice it's sort of pretty much nailed it. This can hedge its bets between a 4 and a 9, and this can hedge its bets between a 5 and an 8. But they're pretty clean means. So this is a really good example of clustering. The referee who rejected the paper said we hadn't shown any examples of clustering in our paper. And as far as I know, this is the best ever example of unsupervised clustering of MNIST. Although Yam may have an example that's about as good. Um, so that was annoying. If you take the two, that's its mean. If you say take the first factor of this factor analyzer and subtract two standard deviations worth of the first factor from the mean, and then reconstruct the poses of the pieces, and then from those reconstruct the image, what do you get? That's what you get. And if you add two standard deviations, you get that. That's a totally nonlinear transformation, right? And that's why applying factor analysis to pixels is crazy. Um, but if you apply it to pose vectors, it's exactly the right thing to do. Because in pose vectors, the structure you want to get at is linear. OK. Taman then decided he'd use more capsules. Um, and what he did was he's discovered the dot matrix printer. If you give it 50 capsules, it'll make each capsule put a little dot in the image. And all this recognition hardware will be to decide where to put that dot. And out of little dots, you can make anything. Um, so Rob would tell you the solution to this is to use sparseness. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to run 50 iterations of using L1 to suppress the activities of something. Um, an alternative would be to say, let's take 50 capsules. And for any one image, let's just throw away 45 of them. Actually, we'll throw them away with probability 0.9. So some images only have a few, some have half a dozen. Um, and that has the same effect. So we used massive dropout and This is just 14 of the capsules. and I'm afraid the contrast is the wrong way around. Um, so this is an image. This is the reconstructed image. And in this data, Taman put a big border around the image so you could translate things. So notice this three is translated over a lot relative to that three. So he's doing big translations. Um, but notice, even though there's a big translation, it's reconstructed very crisply. Now if you look here, you see what the first 14 capsules are contributing when you reconstruct this three. You've got one that's picked up on a loop like that. You've got one that's picked up on the bottom loop. You've got one that's picked up on the sort of top bit. One that's picked up on this piece here. You've even got one that's picked up on the fact that there's a parallel stroke here and here. So this one, see, it's, it's a bit faint, but there's a stroke there and a stroke there. It's picked up on a pair of parallel, parallel strokes. And there's another um, 36 of them. And at, so at test time, when we want to reconstruct, we use all of those but at only, with only a tenth of the intensity, because they're all there now. And then you get these very nice reconstructions. During training, the reconstructions won't be very good at all, because it's given a random five of those to work with, and it has to make them work as well as possible. Um, the next thing is to do factor analysis on this. Now, the problem with factor analysis is if you leave out some of the data, because it's a directed graphical model, it's perfectly happy with some of the data being left out. But it's more computationally expensive. The matrix that you use to infer the factor values from the data has to be recomputed each time if you leave out different bits, if there's missing bits. So you have to do a matrix inversion. The good news is the matrix inversion doesn't involve the missing bits. In a directed model, the missing bits, you just throw them away and forget about them. Um, so if you use, say, five of these capsules during training, then, and each one has, say, this is doing full affines, by the way. Each one has six parameters. That's only 30 parameters. So you only have to invert a 30 by 30 matrix. So you can afford to do it for every training case. Um, and we're in the middle of doing that now. Let me show you one more nice thing about this, which I'm not sure you can see from back there. But anyway, there's a little five here and a five here that's moved over and much bigger. And this capsule here, the one that got this loop of the three, is getting this loop of the five and it's very faint here, but it's getting the corresponding loop of this five. So it's found that the recognition hardware that's being used to decide what parameters the capsule should have has discovered the fact that this bit corresponds to that this bit. And that's obviously going to be very good for shape recognition. So I could give you a prediction of how well this is going to work, but we haven't actually 
don't appreciate recognition yet, and so that would be silly. Um, now, there are other ways to learn these low-level parts. You could, for example, use pairs of images, and that's the idea of a transforming autoencoder. So particularly if you know the transformation, so if we're just dealing with translation, then when you move your eyes, your brain tells your visual cortex what the eye movement was. Um, you can tell that, because if you move your eyes without your brain being involved, at least not in a sensible way, um, the world will jump. But if you move your eyes deliberately, it doesn't jump. And the way to do this experiment is take your finger, jab your eye hard, and the world will jump. Promise. Um, okay. So we have this information in our brain of how the thing slid across the retina, because our cortex has told our our front lobes have told our visual cortex about that. So why not use that? So if you think about shape recognition in static images so far, we've got a lot of mileage out of transforming the image to make more data. But you don't tell the net what the transformation was. You just transform the image and say, here's another example of a three. If you transformed the image, wouldn't you be telling the net much more if you said, here's a three, and look, here's another three, and that's been transformed by this much. So if you give it the pair and tell it the transformation, you're giving it hugely more information. Video, of course, is like that, particularly if you have a static world and you move around in it, so you know the camera motion. You're getting hugely more information than if you just have static images. And so I decided to try using that. And that leads to an idea called a transforming autoencoder, where actually the picture is the best way to explain it. So the bottom bit of this picture you've seen before, previously what we had was a hand-coded graphics model here that you back-propagated through in order to learn this stuff. Now what we're going to do is have a model that has to be learned that's kind of like this but backwards. But we're going to force it to learn x and y here. So previously we forced it to learn x and y because we used these numbers to translate the template and plunk it in the image. So if it didn't make these numbers mean x and y, it couldn't get the right answer. Now we're going to force it to use x and y in a slightly more subtle way. We're going to give it the input. We're going to tell it what the translation was. And it's the same translation for everybody, because it's what we translated this by to get that. And what we're going to do is, after the capsules have extracted x and y and p for this, we're going to add delta x to x and delta y to y, and then say, from those transformed things, from that transformed pose, you have to reconstruct the transformed image. So now it can't do trivial cheats like using a dot matrix printer, because it has to be the transformed thing. And now that forces it to get the right semantics for x and y. Because the whole trick here is, how do you force it to get that representation that the computer graphics guys use so that everything becomes nice and linear? And that works very nicely. And you can make it be not just delta x and delta y, you can make it be um, rotations and scalings and things. So you can get the capsules to compute to, to get a whole bunch of pose parameters, multiply by matrix, get the transform pose parameters, and then reconstruct the transform thing. A student called Cedar Wang, who's now at Stanford, made that work very nicely. You can even do it for 3D, and you won't see convolutional nets being used we won't see convolutions on 3D stuff being used very much. Um, but with this, you don't really have to tile the space. You just have a capsule that gives you some numbers. This is for 2D with full affines. If you go to 3D, you have to take this 3 by 3 matrix and make it a 4 by 4 matrix, which shows that 3D is 1 and 7 16th times as hard as 2D, at least for this method. But for convolutional nets, it's a whole new dimension, and you have to tile across all these You'd have to, you know, it, things get out of hand. Whereas if you use computer graphics representation, they don't get out of hand. So Alex Krzyzewski, the very same Alex Krzyzewski who got the wonderful results on ImageNet, um, took some models that you can get from the web, um, models of cars and things, and made stereo image pairs where he knew what the viewpoint was. He then 
fed these stereo image pairs into a net with several layers of recognition units and with local fields. Um, it wasn't convolutional, but it, it was tiled local fields, um, I'm fairly sure. And then he got the net to reconstruct a transformed stereo pair. So what he's going to do is give it a stereo pair like that. He's going to tell it the change in this viewing angle and the change in this viewing angle. And he's going to say, OK, if I change the viewing angles like this and like this, what will it look like? And this poor neural net has to reconstruct the new stereo pair. To do that, it has to understand about the depths of things. I mean, if there's a short vertical line in the image, it has to decide whether that's a very foreshortened line that's almost horizontal. Because the way that behaves when you change viewpoint is totally different from the way a short vertical line behaves when you change viewpoint, if you change the elevation of your viewpoint. So it has to use the stereo to get the 3D structure of what's going on, then transform that 3D structure in the way that it's told to, and then recreate the stereo from that new viewpoint. And using GPUs and a few days of um, grinding away, it learns to do that. So this is the training data. And this is what it should output. It's never shown this. It's just told this and the change in viewpoint that would give you that. This plus the change in viewpoint, it outputs that. And you can see that it's not perfect, but it's got it from the right viewpoint. Um, here's some more examples where it's a bit messy, but it gets it from the right viewpoint. Now, this is training data. Um, and this is his first system. He made the system work a bit better, and then it also works on test data. Um, so this is some test data, and in this test data he's using cars that have spoilers on. And in the training set, there weren't any cars with spoilers. And the first system he had, if you gave it a car with a spoiler, it kind of spoiled it. Um, but now it works. So if you look here, um, look at this one. It's understood about foreshortening, right? It sees this spoiler. It's never seen spoilers before. When it reconstructs a car, it reconstructs it foreshortened because you've, your viewpoint's got lower down. Um, so this is actually an indicating that, using this transforming autoencoder, it's actually internally, it's understood the 3D structure of things. I don't think you can do this task without understanding 3D structure on sort of novel objects. And that's the end of what I had to say. Um, the work on transforming autoencoders is on my web page there. Um, the work on dropout that I described yesterday, we submitted it to science, but they didn't like it. Um, and so we've made put it on archive. And so the work on dropout is there. Um, and that's the end of my lectures, I think. Um, so, but we have plenty of time for questions now.